Marines. So we're kind of like the Marines this afternoon, the few, the proud. Um, and I appreciate y'all hanging in. And Sam used the word whimsy earlier in the day. So a lot of great naval history talked about here. And now we're going to talk about fiction. So um, uh, I, I'm glad you're here hanging in for that. I really have three goals this afternoon. One is uh, to stop talking before you stop listening. Okay. The second is to leave you mildly dissatisfied. And I say that because I'm going to uh, use spider ready room tactics, go through these slides very quickly. Uh, it's my intent is not for you to read every word on every bullet on every slide, but I'll show you how these slides will be available to you uh, after the event. And then the third objective is to really to have you give some mindful thought to what it is you want to write. Now, I'm going to talk about fiction, but that's not all I'm going to talk about. So We'll start off with this, um, again, kind of fast and furious, so, um, so here we go. Subtitle for this, or the second title is, because I think that's what Sam asked me to talk about, so you want to be a fiction writer. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of why you might want to do that and why you might not want to do that. This is why I want to do it. Uh, some of you know Dick Couch, or at least know of him. Uh, he wrote probably the best book on uh, SEAL operations in the Vietnam War, SEAL Team 1 very accomplished author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, but this is why I write. I want to be these people. I don't want to be a baby boomer age guy. I want to be a lieutenant again. So uh, this is the other reason people write, and the reason many of you have spoken already and, and earlier speakers write, as our friend Norman Palmer said, history is what the historians say it is. When we think about it, you know, there were people at these events, and usually only one or two of them actually wrote down what happened. But before we move into fiction, I really wanted to tip the hat to nonfiction, because to be honest with you, when I'm standing at the grocery store in line with someone, they come up and they want to write one of two things. They want to write a novel, or they want to write a memoir of a relative that fought in a war and had some accomplishments that they want to talk about for very good family reasons. But before we leap into fiction and get all liquored up about that, many of you know most of these writers. And in my opinion, these books uh, are better than any novel I have ever read. Walter Isaacson, if you haven't read The Innovators, that is the history of the computer age. Now, what could be more boring than computers, right? But it's fascinating. Uh, David McCullough, when I was uh, in command of USS Cleveland, uh, we did drug ops, went through the Panama Canal four times. Before I went through the Panama Canal, I read his book, The Path Between the Seas. Holy moly, what a great experience that passage was, having read that book. And so on down the list. Ian Toll, uh, Five Frigates, holy mac. I mean, this is living history. So in my opinion, it takes much more talent. And for me, the books are much more engaging than any novel I've read. That kind of carried me forward into just very quickly two nonfiction books. Uh, I worked on this book, uh, did with Tom Phillips, Vietnam veteran, leave no man behind. It's the history of combat search and rescue. And we wanted to tell the story of all these heroic rescues, but not just make it standalone stories, but how the discipline of combat search and rescue evolved over the years through successes and more importantly, through lack of successes. I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A. And then we did this book that uh, Naval Institute was kind enough to publish about the Kissick Sailor. Everyone remember this picture, at least seen it once. Um, there is a huge story behind uh, why there was such controversy about this picture. And again, not to take away from the fiction part, but happy to address in the Q&A or, or, or in the sidebar. Um, so why else should we write? I work in a, in, a, in a place with scientists and engineers who think in PowerPoint, um, don't, who don't write anything, who can't write prose, who don't want to write prose. Um, and we are very data-driven. We want to make decisions based on metrics. And I'm here to tell you that no one really does this. After they've seen all the eye-watering data on PowerPoint slides, they want a story, okay? But it takes courage to write. If I remember this fella, one of his more famous sayings. So, and I say that only half tongue in cheek. I mean, if you want to write, whether it's a magazine article, a journal article, nonfiction, fiction, you better have a thick skin. Just go on Amazon and read some of the reviews. No one says, well, I really didn't like this book that much. I mean, they say it is complete 
trash. So if you don't have a thick skin, this, this probably isn't something you want to have. It. Anyway, Sam was kind enough. I said, Sam, what do you want me to talk about? And he teed up some of these questions here, which I think are all good questions. Certainly, we can't address everything in 45 minutes. But these are my kind of what we'll talk about and how we'll address them. Uh, WTA will talk about it, okay, in, in the slides I'm going to share with you. But just to get the other ones out of the way and to answer those questions, because people ask them, it's, it's kind of a personal journey. Uh, Why did you just start, decide to start writing novels? And, you know, it's an old saying, uh, and not to be over religious about it or anything, it's an old saying, you make plans, but God laughs, right? So I've been writing articles in professional magazines since 1978. I started very, very young, younger than this young No, only kidding, but way back. And my best friend in the world, went to high school with him, a uh, very successful screenwriter in Los Angeles. He and his wife didn't have kids, so they used to visit us um, in Coronado and kind of half adopted our kids. And one time, uh, my friend Bill was, um, uh, we're watching, you know, I hope he's not a personal friend of it, this wretched Steven Seagal movie. No plot, all kinetics. And I said, Bill, why don't you write a screenplay? This, this thing is so bad. And he says, why don't you write a novel? And I went kind of tut tut, you know, I'm just writing articles for professional magazines. And you know how it is when you have a friend kind of poking you, you know, he kind of held my hand and I did my first novel, but that's how it got started. No intent, just kind of living my life and, and trying to be responsive to a friend. Uh, is it harder than nonfiction? No, those two books I showed you and the book I did with Sam uh, on AI at War, much more work, much more resource. Why? You have to get it right. You have to get it right and you have to honor the past and do your research and not leave huge chunks out. Um, how did you know I didn't? I had no idea. When I did my first novel, I, I, I went to the Coronado Library about what you do and I read a book and it said, throw it over the transom to all these agents and then throw it over the transom to all these publishers. And, and that's what I did, but I had no idea. I, I didn't have enough ego to say, yeah, it's going to work. It was like, and when the, when the editor called me and said, I want to buy your book, I was like dizzy. I didn't know what to say. So, so very lucky. And then how to find a publisher, persistence, throw it over the transom, you know, right. And I could talk more about that in, in the Q&A about, you know, there's some art to that. It's not just science, but, but probably worth talking about. So the rest of this, these slides, I'll, I'll try to address the, you know, what, what we'll talk about. Part. So, um, this is kind of how I wanted to tee it up if I were advertising this, if this was a seminar that people were, were coming to and we wanted to encourage them, this is what I'd, I'd say we talk about. So that's kind of the executive summary or the, or the premise. So before, it's, this is trying to narrow your scope from I want to write something to what is it I want to write. So when you talk about fiction, there's two main genres. There's, there's mainstream fiction, you know, that's like something by, by Tom Wolfe or, or other very noteworthy article uh, authors read, reviewed in the New York Times kind of books. And then there's genre fiction. Now, 20 years ago, the word genre was followed by another word with G. Anyone know what it was? Ghetto. You know, it was like you were the great unwashed that you were writing in genre. But now it's become more acceptable. Why? Because people buy these books. So you just have to pick which genre it is. Anyone want to guess what we're standing here though, what the most, the most popular by far genre is? Romance. You got it. Okay. So I don't think anyone here is in that one. I'm sure not, but if you want to make money, that's where you'll be. So you do all this work and one way to get published is to write the entire 70, 80, 90,000 word manuscript and ship it to an agent or a publisher and wait. And who has time to read that much? So what's become accepted today is you do a treatment and a narrative outline. This was the first book we did for Opsetter that Sam mentioned. And uh, walking it back, Dick and I did a book, um, Act of Valor, which is the novelization, meaning it came out after the movie Act of Valor, which just came out 10 years ago, about SEALs. Most of you probably saw that movie. And we wanted to get the contract and we were auditioning. So did we need to put that many words in? Well, as Sam said, George is a lot more OCD than I am. So George wanted to put this many words in it to make sure we got the, the contract. But these are the kinds of things you put in a treatment, which tells about the novel. And then you do a narrative outline, which is chapter one will say this, chapter two will say that. And for a 
four or five page scene, you may have a short paragraph and you just kind of march it through. That's not to say that's rigid because as the novel evolves and as most people say, as your characters take over, what you say chapter 31 is gonna say may change a bit, but at least it gets you started because I can't tell you how many people I talked to that said, oh, I have writer's block. There's no way you can have writer's block with this. You know, you get up and you say, okay, it's chapter 13. I need to get to work. And there are people who are planners like me. And there are people that, who are pantsers who just get up and will do that and not have righteous. Block. I don't know how they do it. God bless them. But it's, you know, I'm married to a school teacher outline. So that's, this is your, this is your outline. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about imagining and producing your article, the original idea. And I'll talk the most about that. Um, the things that you must do, we'll focus on those. And this isn't a one-time inoculation. I'm gonna take you to my website at the very end where there's some useful tactic techniques or procedures you're welcome to grab for free. So what should you write about? You know, and, and again, it's that idea you have, and we'll talk about the idea, but the bottom line advice I could give is whatever you're passionate about. And if you read the New York Times book review and you go, oh, those kinds of books are selling now, I'm gonna write a book about that because it'll sell, guess what? By the time you get your thing, your treatment and narrative outline and your thing and your contract and your book published, guess what? That's not the thing anymore. So write what you're passionate about because it'll carry you through. And think of it in terms of you're at a bar with friends. So you're in a bar with your friends, people are telling stories and you wait for the other person to completely stop before you jump in, right? Well, you're saying yes, but I'm not, the, the believability thing's not here. No, you jump in and you want to say it and you're passionate about it. And that's what, that's what I mean. This is what my first agent always said. Talk about what you're passionate about. What do I wish I had more time for? What do I, you know, what would I do if I were a professional dilettante? And the things you see bullets are, I won't spend a lot of time on each bullet, but you know, what are people curious about, about you? And then what do they ask you for advice about? So these are the things as you're thinking about what to write about, they're things that are already in your DNA, not something you see at a bestseller list. So because I think it's so important, I wanted to spend a little time talking about your original idea. Where does that come from? And where, does it have to come from one place or is it a pretty broad spectrum? So you're the steward of your idea. It's your idea and it's yours alone. Best advice I could give is don't share it. If you share it with your significant other or your friends, guess what? They're going to have a better idea. No, why don't you talk about this thing instead? And so that passion that you've had well up, people are telling you it's dumber than dirt. So, so just keep it to yourself for a while. It's the foundation of your book. It's the inspiration. It's the spark. It's the little sticky you put on the side of your computer monitor. And, and don't too, too much. Let it germinate. Think about it. Flesh it out. Make it, make it better. And then come up with another idea. And put that first idea on trial and say, well, it's idea number two better. And if you try out some other ideas and you keep going back and go, no, the first one was really great or the third one's great, go with that one. But, but, but let that one stick with you for a while. Can you state your idea in one sense? And I got to tell you, when somebody, friend is sharing his or her idea for a novel, it's paragraph after paragraph. And I'm going like, what's the thing? What's the main thing? So this is hard. Uh, it's been hard for me to do. If you can't do this, start over because this one sentence is your creative focus. It'll help describe what that is. And it's often the core of the pitch to sell your book. If you get an agent, your agent's gonna have lunch with an editor. We'll talk about uh, in the Q and A, if you like, what, well, who that editor is or why it's that editor. And he's gonna say, I got a great idea for a book. It's one sentence. And my friend, Bill, who's a screenwriter, who has pitched many, many successful small and big screen movies. It's a one line pitch, that's it. That's all these big people have time for. So that's what you gotta do. And it keeps you focused. Ideas can come from so many places. And I just wanna ripple through what those are. It can be a high concept. It can be a theme, a plot, characters, a what if, and a setting or a scene. I'm kind of a what if guy, but I wanna emphasize that whatever works for you, wherever your sort of DNA takes you. So, the two breaking points of this, the two paths you go down, it's either outward focus, which is a situation idea, uh, and that's about a plot and a problem or a what if, or, you know, what, what could happen? So you're thinking in terms of plot. A character idea is inward focused. You're thinking about the characters and about the people. 
if we have a lot of time, and I've got these slides in the backup, which you can look at later, but I'll, but I'll jump in there now to kind of break down the outward or plot or inward or um, character. So anyone familiar with the series Law and Order? Okay, long running series, hugely successful. When Dick Wolf created that, he'd seen many police procedurals start and then end when the stars left to go do something and become more famous, right? So he made his so plot focused and the characters almost cardboard cut. Tell me if Jack McCoy's married or not. Huh? Who, I mean, we, we don't know any of those things about those people. And that is done very purposely because year over year, some people left and new people came in and people like me kept watching. And guess what happens on February 24th? It's coming back. So that is, that is outward focus. It's, it's a situation. How about Seinfeld? Anyone ever see that? Okay. What was the plot in Seinfeld? What did Jerry Seinfeld say uh, uh, Seinfeld was about? It's a show about nothing, but who could forget the characters? So that's where you're coming from. Now, the perfect book, the wonderful book has both, but most of us, come from one of these two directions. I'm married to a, a, a Southerner. Where do you think she comes from? Character, peoples. One of my old bosses said, Becky Galderisi's never met a stranger. If she were here, she'd be chatting all of you up. I'm from New York City. You know, when I rode the subways, my parents told me not only don't talk to people, but don't make eye contact, right? So this is my world. But the point is we start from a certain place, then we have to flesh out the other. Okay, your books are trying to do both. So very quickly, the different ways, and I've tried to put books or movies most of you have heard about. So this is a high concept. What is this? That's kind of cool. That turned into the book and movie Burners. What about a theme? Have a theme, what's more important? That was the theme of this book. How about a plot? We all like plots. Anyone guess at this one? Pretty famous one. Time Patrol. To be a character. This became a very well-known movie. Body God of Lies. Or how about a what if? What if they really disappeared? Isn't that a cool concept? A cool what if? And that was cut out. So you know, the point is these things can come from many different directions, but embrace whichever one works for you. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do a, a number of seminars and I'm, I'm kind of a best practices guide. I always look for the best practices and friends who attend these go, no, they want to hear from you. They want to hear what worked for you. So talk about your book. So this isn't to try to inspire you to buy these books. They're all for loan, uh, as Sam can tell you, in the car, not a public library. But that was my what if. What if that happened? How would that work? How would that evolve? Another what if was, how does the commanding officer keep the North Koreans from capturing her crew after they've run aground on an island after losing a gunfire? And I write about things that worry me about the Navy. So she was commanding a ship, a, a total combat ship, not a heavily armed ship. So I go like, what's gonna happen if they get in a real fight? Kind of more on the political realm, um, this first of my Rick Holden books, you know, I go, what if the military wasn't real happy with the president? I know given current history, no one can imagine that, but just, just let your mind run wild. What if they tried to get him um, uh, impeached by having a military operation that he was all for and put his pick, hand-picked general in charge of? What, what, would, what would happen? And then again, more to current events. Um, I know this one is, uh, is hitting on, on things that are happening today, uh, but what if Iran attacks Americans, kills Americans, the US does nothing and a carrier strike group commander who for my five years of experience of being a strike group chief of staff, what if he decides to take matters in his own hands and how could he be stopped? So again, things that uh, are contemporary, things that I believe could happen and things that worry me, and that's what I, I tend to, to generate. So I wanna talk about this, this what is it, Omnitrium Perfectum? Anybody trained by the Jesuits who know a little Latin? Anyone? That one is perfect, comes in threes, right? So three things, plotting, characterization, and action. 
And you really want to do all three of those right. And, and it's not that difficult to do. It just keeps, you need to remind yourself you need to do those things. So I'm going to talk mainly about plotting just due to time. I have put backup slides in the brief that when you go online and get it, or I'll show you how to do that. You can kind of go deep dive in that and, and some other form, maybe next year, happy to talk about more in depth. But I'm talking about plot. Why? Because I'm a plot driven guy. And, and I think the plot, I don't care what other fancy things you do. If you don't have a plot, the reader's not going to turn the page and want to know what the hell is going to go on next. So, so that's the plot. So um, simplifying it, think about the last movie you've seen or the last book you've read. One of these two things happened, you know, science fiction, anything. So it, it kind of breaks down to that. So what is a plot? Uh, usually there's four steps, not to be rigid about it, but you got to get to know these people. Um, they try to solve the problem. It's not getting solved. They try to climb out. It's like the frog trying to climb out of a well and all these complications and finally these most horrible things. And then deeply affected by all of this, uh, not only do they save the day, but their lives are changed. They become better people, more rounded people. The term for this is character arc, but that's pretty classic. So you, you can think about what you want to write. You say, how do I get from here to here? Okay. Uh, Ian Fleming, of course, who wrote the, the great James Bond thing, says you, you've got to turn the page. And I want to go back to some of those nonfiction books I mentioned, the Walter Isaacson's and the David McCullough. They, to me, they read like novels. It's not like, well, I've read eight pages of this history. I'm going to put it down now. It's like, no, I want to know what happens next. So that's, you know, that's what it is. You've got to turn the page, whether it's nonfiction or fiction. A guy named James Hall wrote this book, Hit Lit. Uh, I'm not related to him. I don't get royalties for his books, but he, he did a survey of the 12 most popular novels of the 20th century. Popular to him was not book reviews in the New York Times. Guess what it was? Sales, how much money they made. And these were the 12. And look at how different these are. And in his book, in his analysis, he showed how every one of those books talked about America as the shining city on the hill, about religion, about family conflict, about all of these things. But you could, the point I'm trying to make is how different all of these books are, but all of those wonderful ingredients, those plotting ingredients were in these books. So if you're ever thinking about writing a thriller uh, and you're looking for some tactic techniques and procedures, you'll go, oh, they did that in Valley of the Dolls? And they did it in Da Vinci Code too. Whoa, Bubba. And there weren't things I thought about until I read his book. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So, again, wonderful book. It's very, um, very engaging too. Um, there's a way to design a plot. And we'll do a deep dive into that. This is something, again, going back to my friend Bill Blake, a screenwriter. Um, this is called the Hollywood log line. Because this is what people pitching a screenplay uh, will do in Hollywood. They, they get very little time with Mr. and Mrs. Big in the studio. And they give their thing and they say, thank you very much. And they go away and they get called back or they don't call back. But if you think about it, there's, there's a protagonist and an antagonist. There's a, a battle, uh, there's a goal and there's the stakes. And the stakes can't be somebody's social security check isn't gonna arrive on time. I mean, the stakes have to be big stakes, okay? But that's, that's what a, a, a movie line is. If we were doing a two-hour workshop, I'd ask you all to construct one and share it with a partner. Then we talk about it, et cetera, et cetera. But this is really, you, you have to do this. This is one of those mandatory, it's like anybody, naval aviators in the room? Okay. So it's your NATOPS checklist. You have to do these things before you start the helicopter. Otherwise, you'll crash. So this is the most important thing uh, other than your original idea. So you take your idea and you shape it into this. And then um, I think I learned this in third grade, Kipling. You know, we, we all learn about, about the W words. Uh, but this is, if you break it down into Kipling terms, um, what you're doing is the plot. Uh, who is the characters? Why is the, what's at stake? Why, are the, why is this so important to the protagonist and the antagonist? Um, where and when is it? It's a setting. It's, is it a medieval country? Is it uh, the future? 
and uh, the how is the beginning, the middle, and the end. And, and every story has a beginning, middle, end. Most people who teach writing, act one, act two, act three, it works for Shakespeare. It, it works for those, those 12 novels I showed you from James Hall. And your idea won't change, but you're gonna do it differently. And you think about it, um, Mary Shelley wrote a book on Frankenstein. How many books on Frankenstein have sold since then? Hundreds. It's the same idea, but people have done it differently. And so people have figured out a way to write a Frankenstein story that brings something to the table that the one before that didn't. Um, that book we did, Tom and I did, Leave No Man Behind, that was the third book ever published with that exact title. Uh, but our agent did the work and he, he looked at those first two books and they sold so few that it was like they never existed. So, so we, we fair game to use it again. So turning your log line into a narrative, what's that about? There's something called, and I hope this doesn't sound too academic, but these are tried and true methods that um, most books about writing, most writing seminars, somebody is going to talk about these in depth. But this is what a Freitag pyramid looks like. There's an exposition, some background, the exciting incident, something big happens. And then there's rising action, a climax, reversal, falling action, and development. So as a plot-oriented guy, just beginning as a novel, you won't hurt my feelings. Anyone want to guess where George usually stopped? Not down here, that would be wonderful, but guess where George stopped? The climax. We're done. We just killed the antagonist. Let's go home and have a beer. So it's not good enough. And, and, I'll, and I'll mention a story where that's not good. So when I do workshops, we, uh, we try to agree uh, on a book we're all familiar with. This is familiar to everyone for sure. No kidding. You can tell me the plot or that one or that one or that one or that one. Maybe, but this is the one we talk about. The Wizard of Oz. And in the backup slide, I take you through that Freitag pyramid, every bit of it with the Wizard of Oz, a children's book that you've read to your kids or grandkids and say, oh, it's just a simple children's story. It's brilliant. It, it, may, it crushes that Freitag pyramid because it has everything in it and more. So I think if for no other reason, read those backup slides because I think it really tells a good story to you. So that was the plot part. I spent the most time on, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on um, characterization and action. I mean briefly, but there are slides in the backups. Uh, boy, I wish I was selling this slide deck. I, but anyway, um, didn't I just use this slide? Yeah, James Hall hit lit, right? But I'm using it for a different reason. Who wants to stand up and tell me no baloney the plot of any of these novels? I mean, no kidding the plot. I don't. I don't have that much courage. How about the characters? Gone with the Wind, Scarlet O'Hara, Rhett Butler, The Godfather, Don Corleone, Michael Corleone, okay, The Hunt for Red October, Jack Ryan and Marco, I mean, these are the characters we remember because they carried the story. So the point on characterization is, is you want these people to be memorable. As my friend Jim Stavridis told me when he read my first novel, he said, I liked being with Laura and I liked being with the other characters. So that's, they don't have to be totally likable. You don't want them to have no flaws, but you want the characters to be memorable. memorable. And again, that's why I put this list on again, because as you go through reading Hit Lit or think about these books, it's the characters that you really, really remember, even to the point of some of their sayings, right? Okay. So action, very quickly. Don't over-intellectualize it. Don't say every eight pages I've got to have action. Action will evolve quite naturally. Uh, when we did the novelization to Couch and I of, of Act of Valor, I mean, it was a um, pretty straightforward plot from the movie. There were terrorists that were trying to come in across the Mexican border through tunnels with... Uh, Best explosive best suicide best that they would go places and, and kill people. So you knew there was going to be action trying to stop them, but along the way, there was other action trying to find out where they were, trying to intercept the airplane, 
trying to intercept the drug people who were going to smuggle them, et cetera, et cetera. So from the beginning, everything's fine. It's a nice rosy day to we know, we know what we have to have happen at the end. The action that had to evolve along the way was quite natural. It didn't have to be forced. Okay, so, so, okay. So I always like to leave people with some resources. And uh, these are of all the books I've ever read about um, that were helpful in writing fiction. Um, e. Forrester, aspects of the novel, just, just wonderful. Francine Prose, reading like a, a writer. The point of her book is you read, you read a book. Okay, it's great. You decide you want to write books. You read books now much differently. And she kind of walks through what you want to glean out of that book. Um, James Hall, I mentioned Linda Seeger, although she's a screenwriter, the plotting and characterization and action points are the same. And then my good friend Robert Masalo who lives in Santa Monica. Again, I don't get royalties from Robert either, but uh, his, his books about writing, they're funny as hell. Robert's the funniest guy uh, I've ever met. And, and he, he helps you along the way without being, um, Oh, what was that that movie with uh, with Ben Stein, uh, Bueller, the Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Bueller, Bueller? It's just the opposite. You, you, it's joyful to read. And then look at the great courses such as this one. There's really good, good gouge of those. Okay. Um, yeah. If you if you want to, the slides are all posted on my website. You can either write this down or memorize it, or just Google my name and it'll pull up my website, and then I'll show you the website in a second. And again, I'm, I mean, I got a lot of help along the way writing. I'm happy to pay it forward with any of you all. So um, if you email me and say, um, hey, I've written a 120,000 word novel, and will you proofread it for me? I'll, I'll, I'll probably say I've got to take out the trash or something, maybe no. But if you're saying, hey, I have this idea, do you think it's a stupid idea? Do you think it's a great idea or just, just normal interaction, uh, you know, happy to, happy to do that for this group. So, um, so that's where all that gouge is. But having mentioned the website, and of course, this is a slider, but I asked my website person to, oops, to stick to um, Freeze On, this fabulous book that uh, Sam was the, um, uh, the lead editor for. But if you go up here to services, and it's a pull down, and you go to seminars and courses, It'll have one that I did with the uh, six lessons for the Coronado Adult Dead, but I'll have this one too. And you could just kind of roll the slides and, and review it and also see the backup slides, which talk more about characterization uh, and action. And then, um, like I said, I like to pay it forward. So I put stuff on my blog if I see something interesting. And, and like in most military guys, I'm a little, so I have the blog that's divided into six categories. One is national security, one is technology, but one of them is writing tips. So if I read something in the New York Times and I go, God, this is great, I wanna share it. So I put it on my blog. So there's probably three or four score, just what I consider good gouge, stuff I wasn't embarrassed to put on my blog where you can read and you know, it might, it might be worthwhile to you to do some, do some good. So I think that's my get off the stage, so almost. So again, it, it, it is, it is hard work, but if you if you like what you're doing, if you love what you're doing, and my secret is I suck at golf. So my kids are grown. There's no more t-ball games or soccer games to go to Saturday morning. Uh, my wife Becky doesn't want me rearranging the spices in her spice rack, uh, you know, or making noise while she's watching the Today Show. So I write, and, and that's what I do, and that's that's my happy that's my happy place. But it, it is hard work. It's not just the writing. It's the editing and re-editing and copy editing. Um, embarrassed to say when I turned in my first novel to my publisher, uh, it was 140,000 words. He said, are you kidding me? And so he said, I need you to take 40,000 words out. So being a lazy helicopter pilot, I turned to my wife, Becky, who's a school teacher, English major. And uh, I said, hey, honey, could you take 40,000 words out? So she starts working away and I lean over her shoulder. I said, what did you just take out? She said, the missiles. I said, the missiles, that's the most important part. So anyway, uh, you're going to have to do that yourself usually. So I, I try to make them shorter because I have learned that it's, like I said, you can write 70,000 or 110,000, but those painful extra 40,000 are going to haunt you like an albatross because you're going to have to edit them and copy edit them and 
do all those things. And, and just, you know, one small thing, and I've got a, I'm blessed to have a good friend, uh, Kevin McDonald, who uh, majored in journalism at the University of Texas. And he's helped me edit some of my stuff. And he introduced me something called an echo. Anyone familiar with what echo is in writing? It's if you have the same word two or three times on the same page. And it just looks goofy and it needs to, you need to go to the thesaurus and find a different word. But these are some of those, you know, tactic techniques and procedures after, uh, after 15 books, even a thick headed guy like me can kind of learn. Uh, people always say, what are you working on now? It's this Rick Holden thriller series. And again, these are things that, that worry me. I, I talked about these two. Uh, this one, Fire and Ice, which I wrote in 2019, 2020, has Russia uh, trying to strangle Europe's energy supplies. Um, it has them invading a, uh, a Eastern European country. Guess which one? Anyone? No, it's not Ukraine, but thank you for that. It is Belarus. And the reason I picked Belarus was because everyone's writing about Ukraine. Been writing about Ukraine for 10 years. One of Clancy's last books before he died, it was Russian armor and American armor duking it out in Ukraine. So I picked Belarus. But the whole thing, you know, in Belarus, the, 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 the um, uh, country's uh, leader is an autocrat and is oppressing the people. And they're protesting and they're mad. So guess how they're going to? poke the government and poke Russia. They're attacking the gas pipelines. And then of course the government can't do it so Russia moves in, et cetera, et cetera. But these are things that, you know, as a military professional worry me, what if, what if Russia does that? So anyway, again, going back to Dick Couch, that's what he loves doing, that's what I love doing. If you all decide to embrace fiction, if you haven't already, I think that's what you'll love doing. Uh, it can be a labor of love. 